Thank you, brother. God bless you. All right, let's stand together and open your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Tonight, you know, we think about Christmas. We think about giving. We think about what Jesus has gave. And I just felt led tonight to talk about giving's purpose. Giving's purpose. And this will surprise you a little bit when we talk about it. And, of course, by way of giving, first thing we talk about is money. And that is what the Bible deals a whole lot in. And we'll deal with that a whole lot tonight. But we're not just talking about money. We're talking about giving your time. We're talking about giving your talent. We're talking about giving your energy. And like you've heard tonight, prayers and involvement, it takes a lot of time, a lot of involvement to be involved in other people. And we ought to be a very generous people. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. And you are a very generous people. This is one of the most generous churches that I've ever known. And I say that with years of experience of watching what God's done here. Let's read a couple of verses. Look with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 7, every man, according as he is purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a, what kind of giver? Cheerful. cheerful. What a great attitude, a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound and every good work. From verse 8, we have what some people call grace giving. And giving triggers the grace of God to us. No doubt about that. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd touch our hearts tonight. God, teach us what we need from the Word of God, that we'd be encouraged tonight, we'd be closer to you, and be able to serve you better. And we'll thank you for that, for it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Turn over to Philippians chapter 4. The book of Philippians chapter 4. And I want to read a couple of verses. I want to underline a couple of things. All right? Philippians chapter 4. And I want you to turn a lot of passages tonight, so I hope you have your Bible. Hope you got a pen. Hope you can write a couple of things down. All right? Look with me at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 10. If you got the place, say amen. All right? Look at verse 10. And verse 10, 11, 12, and 13 are together in a group. You'll see that as we go through it. Watch. It deals with contentment. Look at verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me has flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. What verse 10 is talking about, Paul had a need. He had a need physically. He needed prayer. He was sick. He had a physical ailment. But he also, more than that, had a financial need. And in verse 10 he said, I rejoice greatly, that you care of me. That's what he's talking about. You cared enough to help me financially. You cared enough to get involved in my life financially. He said, wherein you were careful. In other words, that word careful means you really wanted to just stay with it. You wanted to do more. But you didn't have opportunity to do so. Keep reading verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want. For I have learned whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And ladies and gentlemen, if you want to teach one principle to your children, there it is in one verse. This is one of the greatest principles. Let's forget our children. One of the greatest principles we need to learn. And if we can learn this, I, I joke, used to joke about it, uh, not that I speak in respect to want, for in whatever you know, state I am, whether it be Georgia, whether it be South Carolina, whether it be Virginia, whether it be, can you imagine what it's like in Michigan? I was telling somebody before the service, 139 inches of snow a year, and they got a lot of them up there right now, and I'm not there, and glory to God. <laughs> I'm telling you, whatever state you are, there with to be content. And so that, i tell you, verse 11, if you don't take anything else out of here tonight but that one verse, it's worth your trip tonight. What a great principle. Verse 12, I know both how, and this builds on verse 11, I know both how to be abased. I know how to abound. In other words, I know how to be broke. <laughs> I don't know how to have a little money. In other words, I know how to have nothing. I know how to have enough money to get kind of what I want. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. In other words, it's a God thing. I've learned to be content. Now, verse 13 is in context with that. We quote verse 13 without thinking of verse 10, 11, and 12. But verse 13 follows 10, 11, and 12. I can do how many things? All things through Christ which strengthens me. Now, 14, 15, and 16, all the way down to 17, give you another section in these verses. Notwithstanding, ye have well done, 
that you did communicate with my affliction. In other words, my physical need, the financial need, communicate means you gave. You took part. He said, you did well that you helped me. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning, speaking to the church, the church at Philippi, in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church helped me financially. No church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. He had only had one church that supported him. Reminds me of Filipino pastors I know when I preach mission pastors in Manila, that God calls them in the mission field, and they go and take their children. A young couple went to Bangladesh, and it's kind of the armpit of the world is Bangladesh. And they took their children and went to Bangladesh. And I said, well, how much support you have? And it was kind of the wrong question to ask because they said, well, God's called us to go and God will provide for us. And we have one church that's going to help us. That's all. So if you were looking at American terms, somebody needed $3,000 a month to live and they only had $100 a month, they left with $100 a month. They had one church. That's what Paul said. He said, I need more help than I have but I only had one church that gave me monthly, and that was the church at Philippi. He said, end of verse 15, but ye only. Now look at verse 16. Now even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. You didn't do it every month. You didn't do it regularly. But every once in a while, you sent a gift. Now I want you to look at verse 17, and this ends with another principle. And this is a great principle. Not because I desire a gift. Every ministry including Countryside Baptist Church, including everything you do in this church, whether it be for the building fund, whether it be tithe and offering, whether it be for missions, it's not that the church needs a gift. Not that I desire. Paul said, now here's a man broke. Here's a man that didn't, couldn't pay his hospital bill. <laughs> here's a man that didn't have enough to eat on to stay in a motel. And he said, not that I desire a gift, I desire what? You need to underline that. I desire what? Fruit. I desire, one more time, fruit to whose account? That it may abound to your account. He's pointing to the judgment seat of Christ when you get to heaven. When you stand at the judgment seat of Christ and what you have communicated and what you have done to help people that God has directed you to do, you're going to reap it at the judgment seat of Christ. Just as a CPA would put on your account, or just like you start a retirement fund here on earth, ladies and gentlemen, you have an eternal retirement fund in heaven. You ever thought about that? It's in place tonight. I don't know what you're putting in it, <laughs> but every time we communicate, give, whether it's of ourselves, whether it's of our time, uh, whatever it may be, when we give, we're laying up not just crowns in heaven, but you're laying up something on your account when you get to heaven. That's a great principle. So we got two principles already. Now look at verse 18. But I have all and abound. Now how in the world could you say that? How could you have all and abound? Let me give you a little bit of thought on that for just a minute. I hope it will trigger some more thought on your part. What is the strength of a believer? The what of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. If you've got joy in the Lord, folks, I want to tell you, you can abound. You can get excited. You can be happy if you got the joy of the Lord. One thing I like about coming to church here is what Brother Larry does when he starts off singing. Every time that thing goes 60 seconds, 59 seconds, 57 seconds, 50, and it keeps going. I keep watching. I watch every time. 10, 9, 8. When that thing gets to 1, boom! He didn't like a lot of choir leaders. A lot of choir leaders kind of like this, you know. It gets down to boom, and guy's sitting over here. He's supposed to be leading. It gets down to zero, and he gets up and says, oh, Let's see here. Now, what am I going to sing? Let's see. I hope everybody's doing all right here today, you know, and what are we going to do and jump up? Well, we've had a hard week, and things are really falling apart this week, and the devil's defeated most of us. I know you guys could hardly come to church. You probably got a flat tire tonight, and your wife beats you before you come, and everything's falling apart. And so turning your, what are we going to sing first of all? Who in the world wants to be in that kind of atmosphere? People don't come to church for that. People come to church to do what? <laughs> that's a good way to say it. <laughs> Maybe one Sunday you ought to get up the whole congregation ought to go, boom, get ready to go. And that's the way it ought to be because we need that. See, that's what verse 18, I have all. You know what you got tonight? Somebody tell me what you got. All. You've got all. You've got all God wants you to have. You've got all you need. Have you? Yeah. You've got all you need. 
If Jesus comes back, you're going to heaven. If he takes you beforehand, they may bury your body. You're going to be up there looking down at them. While they're crying, you're going to be rejoicing. If you can hire somebody to cry, that's what Castro had to do. He had to hire a bunch of people to cry at his funeral. <laughs> you know, they had to, the state had to set it up, make somebody mourn, make somebody mourn, and I'm sure it's yours to be a little bit different because you don't have enough money to, no, they'd, they'd weep anyway. But uh, <laughs> isn't it good to have a good time at church and understand great principles God's given us? Look at verse 18. I can't get past it. I have all. Paul, what'd you say? And I abound. I am full, having received of Epiditus the things which were sent from you. Watch what it did to Paul. I don't know what they sent him. I don't know whether they sent him $100 or $1,000 or $200. He said, but that which was sent was an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable. It was well-pleasing to God. In other words, did, that, did what he gave, did it encourage Paul? You better believe it. It encouraged him. Now verse 19 is your third principle. And I'm going to stop here. This is introduction. We're just getting started tonight. All right, look at verse 19. But my God, say it aloud with me, but my God shall supply all of your need according to Countryside Baptist Church's riches, according to First National Bank's riches, according to the uh, federal government in Washington, D.C., whatever our congressmen vote to give us. Is that what it says? It says that you've got a God that knows what you need in advance, and he's got the ability to write a check for it anytime he wants to. Amen? Amen? And I found through my prayers and through my serving the Lord, sometime I get to the point, I say, God, why haven't you already supplied this? Why haven't you given this? And I want to complain a little bit to God, and I pray over and work at it, and it always, when God supplies, I look back and say, God had to teach me something through that. And God knows the, not only the amount, but God knows the timing of what we need. You may be without a job. You may be without something you need. But I want to tell you, God knows in advance what you need. And God's going to take care of what you need. And God's going to take care of you. Amen? That's a great thing to understand. There is no such thing. Now I want to give you a couple things to think about. What is the purpose of giving? Number one, giving is for your protection. Giving is for your protection. What does Malachi 3, 10 and 11 teach us? Go back to Malachi 3 and 10 and 11. What are you in the Old Testament? Malachi is the first book in the Old Testament. You didn't even say anything. I mean, Malachi is what book in the, in the Old Testament? Last book. There you go. All right, look at Malachi chapter, look at verse 10. Bring ye all the what? Times. You got the place? Something about convicting reading the Bible. Look at verse 10. Bring ye all your what? Now tithe is ten percent of the gross. You make a thousand dollars a week. Tithe is hundred dollars. Tithe is not what's left after you pay the government, and after you pay the the income tax, and after you pay your mortgage, and after you pay your gas, and after you pay your car. It, it's it's what you get. It's not what's left over after it's over. So bring ye your tithe where? Storehouse. Storehouse in New Testament is what? What is the storehouse? Local church. I believe in local church giving. I think a person's a member of a church. The tithe belongs to God, and God teaches us the New Testament ought to be given on the first day of the week and is given to God's storehouse, which is a local church. So bring ye all your tithes to the storehouse that you may, there may be meat in mine house. You know one of the things, you can pretty well know this at Countryside, when Brother King gets up and gives that report, and you look at the blessings of it, you can pretty well know there's some meat in the storehouse. There's some meat, and you know what that means? Somebody's been tithing. Amen? Somebody's been tithing, all right? I don't mean everybody, and I don't know what percentage. God knows, and God said, prove me. God's talking to you individually now that you need to prove him because he wants to protect you. God said, if you're tithe, you're going to prove me. What do you mean, God? We'll find out in a minute. Prove me now here with, saith the Lord of hosts, if I not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, and there shall not be room enough to receive it. How many of you believe that? It's a blessing in it. How many of you remember the first time you tithe? I do. I don't have time to go, in, to go into all this. If I finish tonight, maybe I ought to quit and go the rest next week. That might be a good idea. I don't know. Because this is such a great subject. Because Christmas is giving. And uh, 
we, we think about giving and we give to others and we ought to do it with the right motive and all the rest of it. But at the same time, it's all tied into what we give and what God's given us. So God said, prove me now here, we say the Lord, if I not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, and thou shalt not be room enough to receive it. I want to tell you, it's a blessing to be able to tithe. How many of you rebelled against tithing except me? Am I the only one in this building? I'm the only sorry Christian here. To, thank you, brother. I don't feel so lonely tonight. Anybody else will fess up. Thank you, brother. God, God bless you. Look at, look at. Man, we have, we need an altar call. I guess it's going on fine right now. <laughs> what I'm saying is, <laughs> if you didn't, st- how many of you, your parents taught you to tie when you were a kid? How many of your parents taught you to tie? Praise the Lord. That's a great thing. Isn't that a good thing? How many of you had the privilege of teaching your children to tie? All right, see, that is a wonderful thing. But I'm going to tell you, it didn't happen to me. And folks that have been saved here since I've been preaching the last couple of months, it hadn't happened to them. Nobody taught them to tithe. <laughs> they got saved, and now you grow in the grace of giving. Amen? Right. And can I tell you your testimony that you have and what God's done for you is used in a mighty way in others. So God said, prove me if I not open the windows of heaven. How many of us tonight, you may not be able to itemize it, but do you believe tonight that the automobile you're able to drive, the food you're able to eat, and the freedom you're able to buy a meal out if you want to, and you can buy a donut if you want to without being bankrupt, and you can make your mortgage payment, and you can buy the kids a little something for Christmas, and how many of you kind of recognize God blesses you if you tithe, amen? God blesses you if you tithe, he does. He really does. He'll bless you if you're tired. But now watch this. He'll do something else. In verse 11, I'm going to rebuke somebody. Who's he going to rebuke? Verse 11. Who does it say? The devourer. Who is the devourer? Satan. You recognize that Satan wants to do some bad things to you? Who is it that says, no, God Almighty? And God said, If you look at it, and I will. Verse 11 follows in through verse 10. Not only will God open the windows of heaven, but he said, I'm going to do something else. When Satan wants to have you, and Satan wants to devour you, I'm going to say, no. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. That's a great thing to understand. And so I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, Neither shall your, well, let's put this where we understand. I'm going to rebuke the devourer, and your car won't break down as much as it would have broke down. And your washing machine won't fall apart quite as much as it was going to fall apart. June came out and told me recently, we got a washer and dryer in the house that we bought. We came back there and went in it. And how many of you know a washer and dryer is pretty expensive? If you, you know, this kind of thing. So they had one in it, had a couple of clicks in it. What do I care? The door shut when it's washing and drying anyway. I don't care how old it is, as long as it's wash and dry. Amen? The little knob dropped off the dryer here. I said, June, let me teach you to use a pair of pliers. So I got a pair of needle nose pliers. How many know what needle nose pliers are? And you reach in and you can pull that little thing out where the thing is broke, where you turn it over here to make it start. And I said, now these pliers here, you grip it and you turn it like it was the knob. She said, you expect me to use that? I said, as long as it keeps working. Amen? And we got a dryer, it works. It just keeps working. You say, why don't you go out and buy a new one? Well, I want to buy a new one. I can have fun with that one. My kids get on me all the time when someone gets around about a T-shirt. Any you men like that? You got a T-shirt that's got holes in it, and it's raggedy, and you love it. You absolutely love it. And everybody, why don't you buy a new T-shirt? What's wrong? What do you want a new one for? That one will do the job. Can I get a witness to that? Amen. And you just keep enjoying that. Women, listen, men are different than women. And praise the Lord for the little bit of difference. Amen. Preacher said one time he was up preaching and he got waxing eloquent about the feminist movement in America. And a drunk staggered in and laid on the front row and almost went to sleep, but he could see he's listening a little bit. So the preacher got up preaching. He said, I'll tell you where it is in America. He said, women have the hair this way. Men grow the hair this way. You can hardly tell the difference when you're walking behind them. They wear the same kind of pants. They wear the same kind of shirt. Man, he was waxing eloquent. He said, it's got in America. There's very little difference between a man and a woman. Drunk stands up and he said, thank God for the little bit of difference. Amen. Yeah. So I want to tell you, there is a difference between a man and a woman. Am I right there? And, 
And ladies, give the guy a little space. Let him enjoy his worn T-shirt if he wants to. Just make sure he washes it after he's been to the gym 10 or 12 times. That'll help a little bit, amen, and keeps it in line. All right? So I will rebuke the devour, verse 11, for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Now I'm going to give you one more, and I'm going to stop tonight. I'm not going to be able to do everything I wanted to. I'm going to give you the second one. Giving is your protection. I will rebuke the devour. Giving is also your provision. It is also your provision. We went all the way through Philippians chapter 4, all of those verses, and ended up in verse 19, where the Bible says God is going to do what? Provide all of you, according to whose riches? His riches in glory. So somebody says, well, you know, I've had a lot of bad things. Now, now understand, bad things can happen to you if you tithe. Just because you got a car to break down, which I've had once in a while. Amen. You have too. And you need to, I have to keep mine up. I, I look at the first 100,000 like I'm just getting broke in. I just went through. I got a car with 23,500 miles on it. It's a 2003. It was like brand new. I got it for $8,200. Why do I want to pay $70,000 for the same car? So you can be impressed when I drive up in the parking lot. Because I want you to know I don't drive anything but the best. Which is what I'm driving, by the way. It's a Yukon. It's got everything on it. Except somewhere to plug in a little, what's that called? The direct line where you can come off my iPhone and play through. The, that's the only thing I don't have. If God had given me one more year, 2004, I'd have it. But God didn't want me to have it so I could gripe about it, I guess. I don't know. But I got everything on it. Well, that was two and a half years ago. It's got 141,000 on it now. And I just got it all the way. I put it in the body shop. I said, take every scratch off of it, put it down. I got a guy I know. He did it for 300 bucks. You can go out and look at it. Now it looks like a brand new car. Got it cleaned out inside out. Had to do a couple of repair things. Had to get it tuned. Had to go. I keep everything up on the thing. It's like a brand new car tonight. I think come down the road. I rented a car to drive down here last week while this one was getting fixed. And it had 17 miles on it when I rented it. I'm not going to tell you the brand. It was a good car. It was all right but it don't touch the car that I'm driving out there tonight. I like that car a whole lot better than the other. Let me tell you what I really like about it. You ready for this? Here's what I really like about it. It's paid for. Could I get a witness? It's paid for. My kids used to come up. <laughs> Kid, when I was at home, kids come up and they said, Dad, how long are you going to drive that car? You know, I always said, one more month. One more month. And I said, let me tell you what it would cost if I bought one to drive one a month. And now, you know what my kids tell their kids? How long are you going to drive that car? They say, one more month. I think we can teach a lot by being a little frugal. I don't mean silly and stupid about something, but being frugal. Somebody asked me recently, I was down in Myrtle Beach, and the way I played golf with you, Ken, you won't believe this, but I was playing golf. And I was over across one of these little Inland, how many have been to Myrtle Beach? You've been to see these beautiful homes, about $6 million homes over there on the other side of the Inland River. And we was over there, and somebody said, I bet you'd like for somebody to give you one of those homes, wouldn't you? Talking to me. I said, I sure would. As long as they'd let me do what I wanted to do with it. They said, what do you mean? I said, I'd sell it. They said, why would you sell it? I said, I couldn't afford the gardener. I couldn't afford taxes. I couldn't afford the electricity on it. Why would we? I said, but if they give it to me and say, you can sell it, then I take the money and use it and diversify it around in the work of God, get as many people saved as I could. Amen? Amen? Yeah. So as long as you can use it right. And that's the way I think God wants us to kind of look at things. I'm not trying to tell you to be a pauper. I'm not trying you to be stingy because let me tell you what generosity is. And I'm going to kind of close with this night because we've got to. And then we'll finish up next week. This is a great subject. Isn't this a great subject? It is a great subject because there's so many principles that are life principles in what God, when we teach, you know, correctly what the Bible talks about, the grace of giving. What is generosity? Generosity is that very unselfish. Generosity is the very unselfish willingness on your part to give and to share. That's generosity. It's a very unselfish willingness on your part to give and to share. Now, it is the human part of us, even if you're lost, that makes you feel compassion. 
Lost people feel compassion. Compassion is not necessarily generosity. What is the difference? It is the work of the Holy Spirit that develops compassion within the believer to he has the quality of showing his compassion by being generous. Is that making any sense at all? So generosity is a Bible grace that God can work into our life. And this Christmas, we have the privilege of being generous. It's, a story is told that Alexander the Great, I like to read history, Alexander the Great came out of his castle, and in the gate there was a beggar. And the beggar was there begging, filthy beggar begging. Alexander stopped on his horse and pulled up and threw him some gold coins. And his steward of his treasury looked at him and he said, Sir, sir, that beggar could have made out quite well if you had given him copper coins. It said that Alexander was great, turned around and looked at him. He said, copper coins would have met the beggar's need, but only golden coins meet Alexander the Great's desire to give. Now, I don't know if that story is true, but I like it. Because that ought to be the heart that we have a little bit. We ought to want for God to give us the ability to do super abundantly more and more and more to help the cause of Christ. I got so many other stories I'd like to tell you. I'll save them the next week and see how it goes from there. Giving. I've given you two things tonight. Number one, it's for your protection. And number two, it provides for you. I'll give you three and four next Wednesday night. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, thank you for the privilege we've had to study the Bible. Thank you for these good people. And God, the opportunity that we have tonight to put you first. Oh, God, we love you. We thank you, God, for the opportunity to be developed into the kind of Christian you want us to be. We pray that you continue that work, and may we be an example and a help to people at this Christmas season. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.